Good evening. Good responsive. <laughs> you know, one of the uh, one of the real joys of being at the Institute of Politics is we have the opportunity uh, to bring people here in real time who are involved in the vital issues uh, of our country and the world. And I, I, I must say, uh, no one fits the bill for this particular moment better than Congressman Adam Schiff. And we'll hear more from <laughs> We'll hear uh, more about him uh, in, a, in a couple of minutes. I just want to say that uh, we have uh, a number of other uh, events that are worthy of your time uh, coming in the uh, next couple of days. Uh, tomorrow, the Institute of Politics the Energy Policy Institute of the University of Chicago and the program on the global environment are hosting a discussion exploring if there is a politically viable path forward for U.S. climate policy and how the Trump administration's climate and energy policies differ uh, from President Obama's. And uh, our guests will include uh, Brian Deese, who is senior advisor to uh, President Obama on climate and energy, Jennifer Granholm, who is a, is she here? Oh, there she is, right there. How about a hand for Jennifer <laughs> Graham? <laughs> Former uh, governor of Michigan and IOP fellow, and uh, Michael Greenstone, the director of the Energy Policy Institute uh, of the University of Chicago, and Jeffrey Homestead, uh, uh, a uh, former assistant administrator in the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency uh, under uh, the Bush administration. Um, and then that's tomorrow night. And Wednesday night, we'll have a uh, panel of current and former members of Congress to examine the President's first 100 days in office and discuss the administration's uh, relationship with Congress, something Congressman Schiff probably has more than a passing interest in. Uh, uh, Congressman Ro Khanna from California, Congressman Sherry Bustos from Illinois, and former Congressman Bob Dold from Illinois, who's also a, a fellow at the Institute of Politics uh, this quarter. Uh, you can find out more about all of our upcoming events on our website at politics.uchicago.edu. We'll have audience questions, uh, if I ever yield the floor, um, <laughs> after Steve Edwards and Congressman Schiff uh, have a conversation. And as usual, we'll prioritize students uh, for the first uh, three questions asked. Uh, and. Uh, I'll just read this to you. Now is a good time to make sure your phones are on silent. Okay. And restrooms are on the first floor. I get all the elegant assignments here. And here to uh, formally introduce our speaker uh, is Eleanor Kerala. Did I do it right? Where is she? Yes, I did it, yes. Who is a second year student in the college, uh, majoring in public policy and English. She's a member of the Women in Public Service program at the IOP and is an intern at the IOP. Please join me in welcoming El Eleanor. Most currently known for his work on the House Intelligence Committee and its very public investigation of Russia's possible interference in the election, uh, Congressman Adam Schiff might also be the first lawmaker to ever draw blood from Stephen Colbert. On his show, at least. I don't know what goes on after. <laughs> after graduating from Stanford University and Harvard Law School, the congressman worked as an assistant U.S. attorney in Los Angeles. His history th with Russian espionage goes far beyond the election of 2016 and even to the 90s, where he prosecuted the first ever FBI agent to be indicted for espionage for passing documents to the Soviet Union. While in Congress, Congressman Schiff has heavily focused on both the economy and national security, sitting on numerous committees, including the House Appropriations Committee and the Benghazi Select Committee, and currently acts as a top-ranking Democrat member of the House Intelligence Committee. He has been a strong advocate for a congressional vote on the authorization of military force against ISIS, and he was the author of the 2010 Nuclear Forensics and Attribution Act, which addresses the limiting and monitoring of nuclear proliferation, which is all too relevant right now considering what's going on with North Korea. His experience working with national security and foreign policy lends itself to what's sure to be a very enlightening discussion on protecting the United States, from the status of the ongoing investigation of Russia's possible interference in the 2016 presidential election, 
uh, to the relationship between Congress and President Trump um, and their ability to work with each other or to even thwart one another. Uh, so leading tonight's discussion is IOP's Executive Director, Steve Edwards. So please join me in welcoming Congressman Schiff and Steve Edwards. Eleanor, thanks so much. Thanks to all of you for making time to be here. Congressman, special thanks to you for making time to be here in what I know has been an intense uh, period of weeks for you and uh, no shortage of media requests. So thanks for carving out time for us. My pleasure. Uh, what a elegant uh, surrounding uh, here. I, it's a delight to be on campus and thanks again for inviting me. We're trying to recreate uh, the, the, the environment of the House Intelligence Committee here to give you a, <laughs> this, this a replay so, of This is your so much testimony. nicer. <laughs> uh, you know, one of the uh, less known facts about our committee is we meet three floors below the Capitol. There are no windows. All the information coming in is bad all the time. And it's probably good that we're underground because we'd want to leap out the window if we had one. Um, but uh, it is so nice to see sunlight and to uh, be out, uh, out of those parts for a while. Well, let's stay with that. Before we move into the topic that everybody here is so interested in, and that is uh, the questions about Russian interference in the election, um, tell us a little bit more about the logistics of how the House Intelligence Committee actually operates. Um, you mentioned the frequency of meetings, but, but how do those meetings work and what are they actually read into from a U.S. intelligence perspective? Well, there are you know, a few aspects uh, of how the committee is structured that make it different from most of the other committees uh, in the House. Uh, we are a select committee, uh, so uh, unlike the membership of other committees which are voted on by the full body of the Democratic caucus or the Republican conference, uh, we are all chosen either by the leader or by the speaker. So they have uh, the sole discretion over who sits on the committee. Uh, it's also the only committee that is term limited uh, by both parties in the House. Uh, and uh, I think the reason for that is there's uh, concern with every committee that the members not be captured by the agencies or the industries that they are overseeing or regulating. Uh, that concern, I think, is heightened in the case of the intelligence agencies. Uh, so there has been this term limit. Now, it's a bit of a mixed bag because it's a fairly short term, uh, and the subject matter is phenomenally complex. Uh, it is you know, about the highest learning curve, I think, of any committee because, by definition, you can't know much about the topic before you get there. Uh, and you spend your first couple years quite literally trying to figure out, as witnesses are speaking, uh, what their acronyms mean. Uh, because they're worse than the DOD people in their use of acronyms. And you find you have lost five of the points they were making because you're still working out and figuring out what were they talking about in the first one. Uh, and you go through that experience for a couple of years uh, until you start to get a, a sufficient base of information where you can then add to that base of information. Uh, it's also probably, uh, apart from some notable uh, incidents lately, uh, the most nonpartisan of all the committees uh, that is due in part to the nature of the, uh, the responsibility. It's obviously not a partisan responsibility uh, in terms of our national defense. But I'm also convinced that a lot of it has to do with the fact that we meet in closed session. So there are no cameras in the belly of our committee. Uh, and there's no grandstanding in our committee because there's no one to grandstand to. Uh, if I, in the middle of a hearing, uh, started uh, grandstanding, my colleagues uh, would look at me and they would say, Adam, who are you talking to? It's just us. <laughs> it's just us. Uh, and so it doesn't have the same kind of uh, you know, theatrical quality that some of the open hearings have. Uh, and it's much more collegial generally. Our staffs sit together, unlike many of the other committees where you have the committee hearing room and then there's one suite of offices on this side for the majority and one suite on this side for the minority, we are all uh, cloistered together. Uh, so it has a very different uh, character than most of the other committees. And, uh, and I think it, it, in many respects, makes it much more amenable to doing the work, uh, even if uh, the surroundings are, are less than uh, sunlit and uplifting. I, I want to go to the substance of the investigation, but let's stay with the dynamic for just a second. So. You were out in front publicly questioning and calling then uh, ultimately for your colleague, the ranking member of that committee, the chair, um, Devin Nunes, to step down by virtue of uh, the contact he had with the White House. 
Um, my understanding is that you were relatively close colleagues, not, not only because of the committee participation, but also the fact that you're both members of the California delegation. So what dynamic did, did that present for you and the committee, and, and why was his behavior so troubling for you? You know, this was, I think, very difficult and very painful uh, for the entire committee, um, and probably one of our most challenging uh, periods for the Intelligence Committee, at least in the last several years. Uh, because the chairman and I do work together very well, have worked together very closely. We're both from California. Um, but I, you know, I made clear very early in the investigation that, uh, that several things. That first of all, I thought the investigation was uh, of enormous uh, importance and consequence and it had to be done right and it had to be done in as nonpartisan a fashion as possible. Uh, but also when people would ask, can this really be done? Are you gonna be able in the minority to do the work you have to do when you don't have the power to subpoena people. You don't have the power to set the agenda. You don't have the power to schedule uh, witnesses to come before the committee. How can you assure anyone that this is going to be credibly done? And you know, my answer was always, I can't promise that that's going to happen. Uh, I can only say that I'm going to do my best to make that happen. Uh, and if we get to any point along the way where I feel like we are not doing a credible investigation, we're not being permitted to do what is necessary, then I'll be public about it because drawing public attention to it is the only lever that I have. Uh, and, and so there were times early on where there were difficulties and problems, uh, but, uh, but we overcame them. Uh, but when it uh, became clear that uh, the chair had gone to the White House to review material, that he then went back to the White House to share with the administration, um, that he was not willing to share with his own committee, but was willing to represent what it meant, this I think posed such a threat to the integrity of the investigation and called uh, our, our inquiry so much uh, uh, into uh, uh, contempt uh, that I had to speak out about it even though it was my colleague and even though it was my chairman. Uh, I think ultimately he made the right decision uh, to step aside and let a different Republican be the co-lead on it. Uh, and, uh, and I've had a number of conversations with Mike Conaway who's the new Republican lead uh, he's a very serious guy. I think he's very committed to doing this uh, investigation in a joint way, in the way it ought to be done. So it has given us a reset. Uh, but uh, certainly uh, there are some you know, challenging times ahead just in terms of getting over the, the difficulties of the last few weeks. But you know, I can report, I think, uh, very happily that we are now back on track. So one other process question, where are we now? in the status of this investigation from the House side? Where, where are we in that procedural sense? Well, you know, I think it's important for people to realize the, the different aspects of the investigation because uh, there, there's been a lot of focus on certain pieces of it without understanding what the whole looks like. Um, what we've agreed to investigate uh, are several issues. The first is, uh, many of you have probably saw the unclassified intelligence assessment that the agencies put out uh, months ago, uh, where they concluded, among other things, the Russians did it, uh, that the Russians were motivated to uh, disrupt our democracy, to injure Hillary Clinton, to help Donald Trump, uh, that they used their slick media uh, campaign, RT, uh, that they hacked uh, different democratic organizations, et cetera. Uh, one part of our investigation is to look at the raw intelligence talk to the analysts, figure out were the conclusions that the IC, the intelligence community, reached supported by the evidence. Um, that in many respects is the simplest part of our investigation because uh, it uh, doesn't require necessarily new fact finding as it does vetting the information the agencies had to make sure it supports the conclusions that they reached. Another key piece of it is what was the US government response? Uh, so, we know the Russians are in the computers of Democratic and Republican organizations, think tanks, uh, and others. Um, how did we respond? How did the FBI react? What was the all of government response? Did we take it sufficiently seriously? Did we recognize it for what it was? Uh, did we first um, perceive this as yet another foreign intelligence gathering effort but not a data weaponization effort. Does that account for what may have been a lethargic reaction to something that would pose a real threat to our democracy? So that's a big piece too. And obviously that's important because 
we need to understand how we responded to develop a better response uh, for when we're attacked. In the future, as our intelligence has, community has concluded, we will be. Uh, this was not a one-off by the Russians. They'll do this again. Uh, a third piece of the investigation is the one that's attracted, uh, obviously, a lot of interest and attention, and that is, did the Russians have help? Uh, what was the role, if any, of U.S. persons, and particularly U.S. persons affiliated with the president's campaign? Um, and, and then there's a fourth element uh, that uh, um, our chairman wanted us to investigate, which was the issue of leaks, uh, which is a perennial uh, issue and problem for every administration, Democratic or Republican. Uh, you can now add, I guess, a fifth uh, area of investigation, uh, and that is whether there were any problems with the uh, minimization of uh, data, uh, the masking or unmasking of names. Uh, this came about as a result, um, at least in terms of our considering it part of the investigation, of the president's uh, accusations against his predecessor that he had been illegally wiretapped by Barack Obama which then morphed into he had been illegally surveilled by Barack Obama, which then morphed into maybe the British did it, which then morphed into maybe it was flaws in masking or unmasking. Uh, but uh, we, in the ordinary course of our oversight responsibilities, already look at the issue of minimization, masking, and unmasking. So we're doing this anyway, whether you consider it a part of the Russia investigation or something separate apart from the Russia investigation. This is part of our bread and butter uh, as the Intelligence Committee. Uh, but that is an issue we're looking at as well. Uh, and that's sort of the range of what we're doing. Um, on the, the issue that uh, has attracted the, probably the most focus, the issue of coordination, as the director of the FBI puts it, or collusion, as we've referred to it more colloquially, um, that, uh, that element we are, and, and actually the other elements as well, we are in the process of uh, uh, going out to the agencies to review documents. Uh, we have exchanged preliminary witness lists. I think we're largely in accord uh, on the first tranche of witnesses. Uh, we are in discussions about what the mechanism will be in terms of the uh, interview of witnesses, the hearings with witnesses, what hearings will be open, what hearings will be closed. Uh, so all of those discussions are taking place. All that work is going on. Uh, you know, from my own point of view, I would, like to, I would like to see us do as much of this as we can publicly, knowing there'll be large components that we can't do publicly. Uh, but I would be concerned if we did all of this behind closed doors uh, and then suddenly released a report uh, that it would not have the acceptance of the public if the public wasn't kept with us during the course of investigation, seeing what we're doing and learning as much as we're able to share. Let's stay with uh, the questions around that aspect of the investigation, the, the collusion or coordination. You have said uh, quite publicly before that the period of July and August of 2016 is a period of immense focus and concern for you when you look at uh, the Trump campaign broadly and what the Russians were doing at that time and associates of, of both the Russian government and, and the Trump sphere. Why is that area and that time period so concerning to you? Well, it concerns me because um, for many years, going well before this uh, election cycle, uh, we have had uh, foreign powers uh, uh, who have hacked into our computer systems in an effort to learn what they can uh, to gather foreign intelligence. And when you look at the whole area of cyber, um, a lot of the categories of what people do in the cyberspace are conflated with each other, and some of our allies and adversaries and others have had an interest in conflating them. Uh, but you have cyber hacking for the purposes of intelligence gathering. You have cyber hacking for the purposes of stealing intellectual property and R&D. Uh, you have hacking for the purposes of weaponizing data. You have the hacking, you have hacking for purposes of preparing the battlefield if you want to uh, identify weaknesses in the, uh, in the grid or in defense systems. Uh, there are a whole range of things that foreign actors do. Uh, there are obviously a range of things that we do uh, in terms of our own foreign intelligence gathering. Um, and it may have looked, uh, and it may in reality have been in the case of Russia and 2016 uh, and 2015, this may have started out much as many of those other efforts uh, have as a mere intelligence gathering 
enterprise by the Russians? What could they find out about people who might become president of the United States? Obviously, the Russians would have a keen interest in that. Uh, but at some point, and it looks like the point is around July, uh, they decided that it was going to be more than that. Uh, or maybe it was the intention all along. Uh, at this point, we still are trying to find out. But at some point, uh, that data was weaponized. Uh, that data was published uh, through WikiLeaks, through other uh, more direct cutouts like Guccifer 2, DC Leaks, uh, published by the Russians, um, either with the knowledge or participation of Russian intel, uh, or through the witting, uh, or if you're particularly uh, generous, uh, unwitting participation of others. Um, these materials were published with the idea of having an impact on the course of our election. And so I think it's particularly important that we find out, um, was this the intention all along, or did something happen? Uh, was there something that took place that caused the Russians to change direction? Uh, and if there was, what was it uh, that caused them to change direction? And of course, if there was the involvement of any U.S. parties, uh, that's something that we need to know as well. But that's one of the reasons why uh, I put uh, such a focus on that period of time. What, what do you think? Well, at this point, I don't know. Uh, and, and I think one of the things that we need to commit ourselves to doing on both sides of the aisle is not treating this as prosecution and defense counsel, but treating this as uh, both of us determined to find out the truth of what took place. Uh, and, and to try to you know, put on political blinders to the degree we can uh, and not, not think about, okay, who's, you know, what are the political consequences that are going to flow from one determination or another, but figure out what, what happened here. Uh, what were the Russian motivations? And, uh, and at this point, there are still a tremendous number of unanswered questions. Where we will end up, uh, whether we'll end up at the point where we conclude that, okay, this was the Russian intention all along, or the Russians changed for this reason, or the Russians had either the, the, uh, the knowing support of uh, U.S. persons or uh, the knowing coordination with U.S. persons or something more. At this point, I don't know uh, where we'll end up. I really don't want to try to prejudge that. Uh, but I do think that it would be uh, uh, a, a gross irresponsibility for us not to do everything we can to find out. I, I want you to talk more about the associates of the Trump campaign, though, too, during this key period. It's something you talked about quite extensively in your opening statements for the most recent committee hearing. You talk about um, the fact that uh, we have contacts between Jeff Sessions and the Russian ambassador. We have at this time the removal of a key provision regarding Russia and Ukraine from the GOP platform. We're learning more about Carter Page and the Russian gas company. So, so tell us the things that, that um, strike you as significant and worthy of further exploration regarding this, this collusion piece? You know, on this topic, there's really not much I can discuss. Uh, it's probably the one area that I can uh, speak the least about. Uh, I did try to set out in, the, in that initial open hearing that we had and using open sources, why two things I, I wanted to set out. One is um, why we needed to look into the issue of collusion uh, and why we needed to try to figure out were these all unrelated, disconnected coincidences, which they could be, uh, or was there something more going on here? Um, but the other point that I want to underscore much more broadly than the issue of collusion or coordination is just why people should care about this. Uh, and, uh, and here, uh, I think that during the campaign, Democrats made, I can't say that it was a mistake because we certainly tried uh, but here, I think we failed at a very important task, and I'm speaking for my party, uh, and that is we didn't persuade the public why they should care about this. Uh, too many people were more interested in what the stolen emails had to say than the fact that they were stolen, mm -hmm. than the fact that a foreign and not friendly power wanted the public to see this in an effort to manipulate uh, the U.S. public. Uh, and I remember having conversations, for example, with the New York Times editorial staff about their coverage of this issue uh, during the campaign and making the point, look, I'm not saying that you should never cover the contents of stolen documents. There may be some of those documents that have such gravity and such public interest that it would be irresponsible not to tell the public about them. 
but it's important always to share the context. Uh, and that context, in my view, ought to be in documents likely stolen by the Russians and published uh, you know, uh, through these outlets for the purposes of X, we learned the following. So that people always understood why they were getting the information they were getting. Then they could decide, okay, I'm gonna disregard it, or in fact, it's gonna be, push me in the opposite direction because I know this power is trying to manipulate me. Or they could decide, I don't care how this came to the light, what's important is that the Democratic Party had this position on Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton. But arm them, the public with the information. And too often, in my view, the way this was presented to the public was, here's what John Podesta had to say, uh, or here's what somebody else had to say. And then at the very end of the article, there was a Clinton spokesman referred, refused to content on the authenticity document, but pointed out uh, or alleged that the Russians had stolen the documents. And that was the only mention that the reader got about the provenance of the information. Um, the best hope that we have in the future of protecting ourselves from this kind of interference in our democracy won't be a cyber defense. Uh, obviously, we've got to work on everything we can to beef up our computer defenses. They're never going to be enough. The cyber realm is the asymmetric battlefield of all asymmetric battlefields because you only need one point of entry on offense. On defense, you have to guard every uh, point of entry. Uh, and so the Russians and the Chinese, the Iranians to a lesser degree, uh, the North Koreans to an even lesser degree are among the most capable cyber actors. There are, if the Russians want to get into your computers, they're going to get in. Uh, and you may recognize spear phishing 99% of the time and the 1% you don't because the fake uh, website or button they put up is just too good, uh, is not going to protect you. The only real defense we have is to inoculate ourselves with good information, to be prepared for it. Uh, and one of the things that we have to be prepared for the next time around is that the Russians or someone else, uh, and here I'm not talking about a 400 pound fat guy in New Jersey, um, <laughs> will not only steal and publish authentic material, but will intersperse it with completely forged material, or even more pernicious, partially forged material. You can imagine what would have been uh, the impact had in the however many thousand uh, Hillary or DNC hacked emails. Uh, they take in one or two or three or four emails uh, and added an additional paragraph. So you have a genuine email with verifiable information and a forged paragraph suggesting illegality. That would be devastating. Not only would the victim of that cyber attack not be able to disprove the information, there wouldn't even be the time. And even if they could, in our highly polarized political climate, it wouldn't be believed. Uh, this is what we may confront in the next round. Uh, and the only way you know, we're gonna protect ourselves is by understanding what our adversaries do, what they did to us, what they're doing in Europe now, uh, you know, I, I, and, and I apologize for the long no, answer No, 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 but, but, but the scenario you lay out suggests that, there, that, that it's inevitable that this will happen, and there's actually very little we could do in, a, in the scenario that you just described. Well, there's little we can do in a strictly technological way. Um, I, you know, I marvel at the fact, uh, and, and obviously we can't throw stones living in our own glass house here, given what impact the Russians had on our elections, and how much was known about it at the time. But you look at the elections in France right now, the Russians are funding Marie Le Pen's party. They're not even hiding it. A Russian bank is providing maybe the most substantial portion of Marie Le Pen's funding. And you might ask yourselves, how can this possibly be effective? The French see this, it's quite open, the Russians aren't even hiding it. But then we look back at our own election, and we realize in July of last year, uh, in the midst of the weaponization of this information, one of the two major party candidates was saying in a public forum, hey Russians, if you're listening, yeah. hack Hillary Clinton's emails, you'll be richly rewarded. So we're not exactly able to claim any more ignorance than French voters are about Russian interference. Uh, but it is astounding to me that that's not immediately disqualifying of Marie Le Pen. Uh, but then it was astounding to me that it wasn't disqualifying of Donald Trump. We had, uh, I think, the tragic confluence 
of factors during the last presidential election, of a Russian willingness to be far less risk averse than they had in the past, uh, far more openly intrusive, and we also had a, a GOP candidate willing to embrace Russian interference. Uh, had it been the election cycle with Mitt Romney or John McCain, I think they would have had the strength of character to say, Russians, I don't want any part of this. Uh, not you'll be rich rewarded, but uh, you will, you will be, pay a price for our interference in our democracy, and I'm not going to make use of any of these ill-gotten gains. Uh, but we had the confluence of events where we had a candidate who was willing to embrace that. Uh, and a public that was so bitterly polarized it was willing to accept it, or at least a large segment of the electorate. And, and in this respect, I always uh, come back to uh, an observation that uh, President Obama made when he uh, held a press conference about the Russian hack uh, and marveled at how the party of Reagan um, could embrace a Kremlin interference in our election. Uh, and the point that he made was that uh, the only reason this was successful for the Russians was that we have allowed our politics to become so polarized that it was enough if they were, were helping you and hurting the other party to accept it. Uh, and, and obviously that's a broader challenge uh, that, that goes well beyond just inoculating ourselves in terms of what the Russians do. Um, they were successful because we allow them to be successful because we ourselves are so divided uh, and, and we are gonna have to find a way of addressing that more fundamental problem. Yeah. I know you obviously wanna be careful about what you speak to with regards to the, the ongoing investigation. Let me try another way though. Um, <laughs> to see if this provides a Very mechanism well, but for you. Very well, I will you. merely try another way to say no. Um, <laughs> What are the questions, the unanswered questions right now, that you and your fellow committee members are, are, are focused on when it comes to uh, the question of what was known about Russian involvement during the campaign and what, what connections perhaps the Trump campaign may have had? What are the things that, that, that you want to know the answers to? Well, I, I think um, a good starting point is to look at what the Russians have done elsewhere. Uh, what have the Russians done in Europe? What have the Russians done in the Caucasus? What have the Russians done uh, in the Middle East and elsewhere? What tactics have the Russians used? Uh, and you know, this goes back to you know, my days as a prosecutor. They used one set of tactics. Then they use some of those same tactics now. Uh, that, back then it was sex for secrets. Uh, often these days it's more money for secrets. But they use a variety of uh, tactics. Uh, they use uh, Certainly the hacking and dumping of information as we saw in our own election. Uh, they use a very slick uh, uh, media platforms like RT to um, mobilize their message. They use paid uh, media trolls. They use uh, computer bots uh, to try to drive stories up our social media food chain so that they're what we see, the stories they want to highlight. They use financial entanglement, uh, so they will cultivate uh, financial relationships with business people, uh, with politicians, so that they can financially ensnare them. Uh, they use uh, compromising material if they could get it. Um, uh, and I think the question we have to answer is, how many of these tactics did the Russians use here? Uh, and, uh, and, and again, I don't know the answer to the, that question, but. Uh, we do know what the Russians do. We know the tactics that they use, uh, and, and I think it's our responsibility to try to figure out how many of those tactics have they used here, uh, and of course, how do we defend ourselves from any of these in the future. Uh, there's much more to inquire about there. I also, though, don't want to leave off uh, some other important issues uh, in the news, including just um, what's taking place in North Korea now, also what took place last week in Syria. Um, the first question, I guess, to ask, though, is on the basis of the developments of the last two weeks, how do you read the Trump foreign policy? Uh, what, would you, what would you characterize the Trump worldview right now and its approach to these issues? Well, of course, I guess whatever I would say and answer that question could change next week. <laughs> um, but I, I, you're I, detecting some changes, is what you're saying. Oh, absolutely, <laughs> with, with uh, breathtaking speed. Yeah. You know, on the, on the positive side, uh, I think one of the most important changes has been 
the marginalization of Steve Bannon uh, in the national security foreign policy sphere, uh, the consolidation, it would appear, of authority uh, uh, by General McMaster uh, and Secretary Mattis. Um, if those trends persist, and, and, uh, and who knows whether they will, uh, and the president has someone vet his tweets, uh, that alone will be a very positive uh, change in direction. Um, you can see what a low bar we're dealing with here. Um, but uh, more substantively in terms of Syria and North Korea, um, on Syria, uh, you know, once you get over the, the dramatic uh, about face of the president, um, a few things really strike me about the, the action that he took on the chemical weapons. The first is, you could tell that he was visibly moved by these images. Uh, and what was notable to me about that is these were the same tragic images we saw years ago. Um, but they looked different now that he was the president and not someone watching from the sidelines. Uh, and, and I have to say that gave me some hope that I didn't have before uh, because after the election, I think all of us uh, you know, certainly the Democratic Party, once we got over our suicidal gloom, <laughs> we hoped that this man would grow in office. And the, the first sign to me, devastating sign that this was not going to happen was what seemed like days later when the president asserted that millions of undocumented immigrants had voted and this is what deprived him of the popular vote. Because when I saw that, I thought, oh my God, he is not gonna grow in office. He's going to be the same person he was on the campaign trail. Uh, and that terrified me. Uh, and, uh, and then when he made that accusation against the president that he was illegally wiretapped by his predecessor, that also I found devastating for much the same reason. I also found it devastating because when you think about what the Russians wanted to achieve in disrupting our democracy, a big part of what they want to achieve is they want to tear us down. They want to tear down the whole idea of democracy and the rule of law. And a loss of faith in institutions and all of those uh, kinds of structures that come with it. Absolutely, as a way of undermining their chief rival in the United States, as a way of undermining Europe and NATO, but, uh, but also a way of perpetuating the Putin regime. And that, that is the underlying common denominator of everything Putin does is the preservation of his regime. What's the threat to his regime? The threat is popular protest and unrest. It's why he is so terrified of the, the color revolutions, the Arab Spring, uh, why he was so uh, upset with Secretary Clinton's uh, condemnation of the fraud in the Russian elections uh, and what he perceived as her active support for the protests in Russia. Uh, and so when the President of the United States, I mention this because when the President of the United States says that his predecessor illegally wiretapped him, what better from the Russian narrative than that, to have the president say that my predecessor is a criminal uh, who wiretapped me, because the Russians can say, they do it too. We wiretap our adversaries, we kill our adversaries, we throw them in prison. We have the president of the United States telling Bill O'Reilly when he's asked, why can't you criticize Putin, he's a killer, say, are we so different? That is exactly what the Russians want here. I'm not saying that's why the president said it, but those lines could not have been written better if they were written in the Kremlin. Uh, and, uh, uh, and this is you know, one of the reasons why I, you know, I think this is, is so important. Um, but anyway. I oh, and you were talking about a, uh, growth in office. Yes, 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 I'm Signs sorry. that he hadn't, but perhaps the response in Syria suggests the, something this, different. The response in Syria said to me, that this may be the first time the president realizes the weight of his office. That now whether he acts in Syria or he doesn't act, he bears responsibility. It's not like when he was on the sidelines and could willy-nilly criticize President Obama. Now the buck stopped with him whether he liked it or not. So I looked at that and I thought, okay, maybe this is a president who for the first time understands the gravity of the job. Now was it the right response? I think certainly there is a powerful moral case to be made for what the president did. Uh, and the case to me was most eloquently made by 
and I don't know whether he was the father of one of those children or a doctor, but you might remember as we were seeing those images, hearing that, uh, that Syrian man say, how can the world let this go on? Uh, and, and that, I think, that question that he asked is the most powerful moral justification for what the president did. Now, there's a completely separate question about whether what the president did was constitutional uh, or legal. Uh, and from my own point of view, um, he should have come to Congress to seek authorization. But then he's not the first to have failed to do so. Uh, and, in the, and in fact, President Obama introduced troops in Syria, something of far greater risk in many respects uh, to American lives uh, than firing cruise missiles at a distance. He did that without congressional authorization. Uh, now, the Obama administration has claimed that the 2001 authorization we passed after 9-11 and the 2002 authorization we passed vis-a-vis uh, -vis Saddam Hussein uh, authorized what we're doing now in Syria and Iraq. Uh, I don't think that's uh, true at all. Um, I think that is a, an enormous constitutional stretch and one that a constitutional scholar like Barack Obama uh, ought to recognize. Um, but I think the president was in the position of wanting Congress to provide an authorization more than the Congress wanted to do so. Uh, you had a very unfortunate confluence of interest between a White House that didn't particularly want its hands tied and a Congress that didn't want to have to vote on the war. And the result is Congress has done nothing to authorize action against ISIS, uh, which didn't exist at the time of 9-11. And that's what we're authorized to go after uh, the, the perpetrators of 9-11 in those early authorizations. Uh, so um, I think that uh, what the president did was uh, perhaps strongly morally sound, uh, but not constitutionally sound. Uh, and uh, I'm going to be reintroducing an authorization use force that I had introduced in the last session, uh, albeit without much success in getting a debate on it, um, to at least authorize our action against ISIS, Al-Qaeda, and the Taliban. Um, in terms of North Korea, um, the President and Vice President have said all options are on the table. Uh, that is certainly true, including the option of unmitigated disaster is very much on the table. Um, there is no good military response to what the North Koreans are doing. Even without the use of a nuclear weapon by the North, they could well decimate uh, Seoul, the capital of South Korea, with conventional artillery. Uh, and the concern I have with the saber rattling is that it leads you to one of two places. And this is the problem that the, the President Obama confronted when he drew his own red line uh, with Assad over chemical weapons. And that is, you're either forced to fall through uh, on the threat of force, uh, or you're forced to look like a paper tiger uh, if you rattle the saber too loudly. Uh, and so when the president says, China, you take care of this or we will, um, or trumpets the fact that we just bombed the Assad regime and we dropped the mother of all ordinance in Afghanistan, take note, North Korea. North Korea now detonates a nuclear device. What does the president do? If the president does nothing, what does that say about the credibility of his threat of force? Uh, if the president does something, where does that lead us? Uh, and uh, I do think the, the administration is right that China is the key. If there is a key, it is China. China has the leverage. Now, as the president acknowledged, um, wow, this is far more complicated than I thought. Uh, and actually, China doesn't have complete control over North Korea. Well, yes. I'm glad you've come to that realization. Um, they do have more influence over North Korea than any, anyone else. Um, they haven't been willing to use it uh, to more than a uh, token degree. So they will turn up some uh, ostensible pressure on the North in terms of their coal or energy uh, supplies or purchases, uh, but not enough to put any real pressure on the regime, certainly not enough to have curbed their ballistic missile program or their nuclear program. Uh, and asking China, China to do it nicely, asking them to do it not so nicely, uh, none of that is going to get China to move in a way if it risks uh, a collapse of the regime, a unification of the peninsula under a Western allied government. 
Uh, so, so what's the answer? How do you put pressure on China to do something? Um, and what can you credibly expect? Well, I, I think the, the way you respond to China on this is by, not in a threatening way, but in a, you know, a very self-evident way, saying if you don't uh, curb nuclear's program, we're going to have to take steps that we don't want and you don't want, uh, including the theater missile defense, which we're already undertaking but also beefing up our naval and military presence in the region, uh, working with our allies to build up their military defense, uh, work on an even stronger common defense pact that will affect not only North Korea, but China. China does not want to see any of these things happen uh, in what China considers its sphere of influence. But all of these steps and more we're going to have to take if North Korea becomes an even greater threat to us. Uh, and that, I believe, would get China's attention. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, uh, and that may or may not be enough to get China to apply the kind of economic pressure that is necessary. We should, I think, couple that with secondary sanctions, which were very effective with Iran. We have, we have sanctions on North Korea, but we could add a, another tier of sanctions that, does, that imposes sanctions on those who do, do business with North Korea. Uh, and if we enact those kind of financial sanctions, which would impact the Chinese considerably, that would potentially have a real uh, choke uh, hold effect uh, on the North. So these are steps that we should be taking before uh, we start brandishing our military uh, capabilities, uh, because who knows where that path leads. I'm going to go to questions from the audience, but as folks line up, let me just um, flip the perspective for a second. What's in it for the regime in North Korea? What, what's driving their behavior now as you see it? Well, you know, what, what is driving uh, their behavior is preservation of the regime and, uh, and... Is it domestic? Is it an effort to um, draw uh, more people back to a table so that they could get a relief from some of the existing sanctions? How do you see all that? You know, I, I would say the first, second, and third priority for the regime is its own survival. Yeah. And in the, in, the, in the case of Kim Jong-un, not only regime survival, but his own personal survival. Uh, he's had a lot of his uh, retinue executed, uh, sometimes in grisly fashion, uh, and, uh, and he's right to be concerned about his own uh, longevity, both in terms of his own people, uh, but also in terms of the inherent weaknesses uh, in that regime. The problem that we confront is I think the North Koreans look at places like Libya uh, and they reach the wrong conclusion, which is Libya gave up its nukes uh, and now Gaddafi is six feet under. Uh, and the only way we uh, can guarantee our safety is if we have a nuclear club, a nuclear threat. Uh, and that's the only thing that will keep the West from seeking regime change or a military uh, strike. That's a very difficult uh, problem for us to overcome. Uh, whether there is a way back to a productive negotiation, uh, I don't know. Um, but I do know that the military options are, are all plagued with enormous problems. Uh, and, and this is a, a challenge that the administration will confront in this term. Uh, it may not happen this week. It may not happen even with a nuclear test by the North Koreans. But I do believe at some point during this regime, they will be able to marry a miniature nuclear warhead on an intercontinental ballistic missile. Uh, and if they can't do that within the next four years, we need to prudently plan as if they can. Uh, so this is likely a crisis this administration will deal with. Uh, and so we need to be taking whatever steps we can now to try to fend off that crisis down the road. All right, let's go to questions in the audience, yes. Uh, Congressman Schiff, my name is Ronan Shatsky. I'm a first year in the college. My apologies, I think I got here a little bit earlier than everyone else, I didn't realize. But, but anyway, so, um, I imagine that on a committee such as the House Intelligence Committee, House Intelligence Committee, th there's a lot of effort that you guys go to, not only to avoid conflicts of interest, but to avoid the appearances of conflicts of interest. So I'm wondering if there are any situations where it might be uh, justifiable to recuse yourself from an investigation, even if you are pretty sure you didn't do anything wrong. I'm in particular referring to calls that I'm sure you've heard about in the last couple of days that you recuse yourself from the investigation for having said that uh, there you'd, you think you'd seen material that would be, that would have gone before a grand jury, I think, saw this somewhere. So is this, 
personally seems fine to me, but would you ever consider recusing yourself from the investigation just on the grounds of wanting to make sure everything is squeaky clean? I think you might be referring to comments, actually, that uh, former Congressman Mike Rogers, who was the former chair of the House Intelligence Committee, saying that the Congressman Schiff had gone too far in some of the public statements. Is that fair to say? Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, uh, you know, for, first of all, uh, and, I, and I think we see this uh, now quite uh, constantly, uh, a, a desire for a tit for tat. The, the chairman stepped down, so the ranking Democrat should step down. The chairman stepped down for a very significant reason, uh, which is um, he allowed the committee to be used to launder information from the White House to be given back to the White House. Uh, that posed a real problem to the credibility of our investigation. I think he made the right decision ultimately to step down. Um, I don't think there's any basis for me to step down, uh, much as I know some of my critics on the right would love that. Um, but uh, I do think that uh, we have a, a real opportunity uh, for a reset of the committee that is already taken, taking place, uh, which is very positive. But uh, I don't view that as a serious uh, request by my colleagues uh, from the right, uh, but rather, well, they had to, so you should too. Thank you for spending your time here. Uh, I'm Michael. I'm second year in the college from San Francisco. Uh, a few months ago, Mikhail Gorbachev said the world is heading to war. Um, how should the United States proceed to want to avoid that uh, and to also secure um, you know, the well-being of the United States, particularly with regards to Russia? Well, I, I don't know whether Mr. Gorbachev was speaking about uh, we're headed towards war with Russia uh, or uh, in, a, in a different context, we're already at war uh, and have been for a very long time. Uh, I think one of the very difficult challenges the administration is going to have to deal with is um, how are we going to conduct this war and what is the, what is the outcome we are seeking here? Uh, we are now uh, well into our second decade of the war in Afghanistan and there are talks going on apparently within the administration of whether we should once again increase our troops in Afghanistan. Um, depending on what happens in Syria, either with chemical weapons or without, there are also calls to increase our troops in Syria. Uh, there are also calls to have a more permanent troop presence in Iraq. Uh, how, how long can this be sustained and with what object? Um, so I think first we need to figure out the war we're in, uh, the war against uh, terrorism, but also the fact that we have significant troop presence uh, in several countries and there are calls to increase that further. I certainly hope that we are not ab about to embark on any new wars. Uh, and, uh, and I don't think we're gonna be in a shooting war with Russia. Uh, I do think we are, if not in a cold war with Russia, uh, in a different kind of ideological struggle now with Russia. It's not communism versus capitalism, but I do think uh, it is authoritarianism versus democracy and representative government. Uh, and I have to say, in that struggle, the autocrats are on the march. Uh, and you see it in the, the rise of the parties of the Marie Le Pens, and uh, you see it in Hungary and in Poland. Uh, you see it in the campaign against Angela Merkel in Germany. Um, and I think we have a global responsibility of leading the fight for uh, democracy. And, and I do think in a, in a very substantial way, the whole idea of liberal democracy is at risk at the moment. Uh, in terms of a real shooting war, you know, the, the gravest risk, I think, at the moment comes from North Korea. Uh, I think the danger of that kind of a shooting war with Iran has receded as a result of the Iran nuclear deal, not gone away, certainly. Uh, and they are as malevolent as ever with the use of their conventional forces and through their uh, proxies. Uh, but uh, the, the, the area that I worry the most about a, another shooting war uh, is in North Korea. Thank you. Thank you very much, Congressman. My name is Dan Simon. I'm a fourth year from the Pennsylvania 8th District. My question today relates to the ability to demonstrate the content of our capabilities. So General McChrystal spoke this morning at the law school and spoke about cyber warfare and how it's fundamentally different from nuclear war in that we could test one nuclear warhead and then test another and demonstrate second strike capabilities. It seems like since Russia annexed uh, Crimea and with the interference, we have not yet responded to demonstrate what we are capable of doing to deter Russia from engaging in these actions. Presumably, 
we have technological capabilities, which we demonstrated with Stuxnet, mm -hmm. things like that. But why have we not responded with second tier sanctions on Russia? Why have we not tried to foment middle class dissent in Russia against Putin because that's sort of the only thing he's afraid of? What is holding us back? Is it an ethical concern? Is it a political concern? And how do we move forward if they continue to wreak havoc, so to speak, on liberal democracies around the world? Well, I think you're absolutely right uh, that in probably no area more than in the area of cyber, we have yet to establish an effective deterrent. Uh, and this was a point that uh, I tried to make uh, when the North Koreans attacked us, uh, when they attacked Sony. Uh, and I took a particular interest in this because I have so much of the entertainment industry in it's my district. district yeah. uh, so it quite literally hit home uh, for me. But um, I urge that we, we make a strong response to this because otherwise North Korea and other nations would conclude that cyber attacks were essentially a freebie, uh, that there was low cost because there would always be some level of deniability. Uh, even when it came to the Russian uh, hack, uh, you still had people maintaining that uh, the Russians didn't do it, uh, it was a false flag operation. Uh, and you know, even, I, I think, you know, very well thought uh, people say, well, the proof is so strong, why, why won't the intelligence agencies show us the proof? The problem, of course, is if we show the public the proof, we are revealing the sources of our information, which the Russians would love, uh, because it will help them hide their attacks in the future. Uh, and it also can put people's lives at risk depending on whether the sources of our information are human or they're technological. So we often can't make public proof not extensively. Now here, we had the benefit of private, uh, you know, very well qualified cyber firms doing cyber attribution. Uh, and, and so I, I don't think there's much residual public question about the Russian involvement. But nonetheless, there's still very little deterrent. Uh, and what I was urging in the case of North Korea, because a cyber attack doesn't always merit a cyber response. It merits a response, but sometimes a more effective, less escalatory response can take other forms. And what I, what I urged in the case of North Korea is not that we necessarily do a cyber tit for tat because we have a lot more to lose than the North Koreans. And you might remember after the North Koreans attacked us, um, the lights went out in Pyongyang. Uh, and people wondered, much as they're wondering right now whether the failed missile test in North Korea is a result of our cyber meddling, the, the, the question was, did we turn out the lights in Pyongyang as a way of sending a message? Now, the reason people couldn't tell is the lights are always going out in Pyongyang. <laughs> um, and obviously, if you're trying to establish a deterrent, uh, you need the people to know that you're trying to deter, that it's you that's doing it. But um, the problem is, yeah, we can turn out the lights in Pyongyang. You know, we, we have very capable cyber uh, um, infrastructure. We could, we could do more damage than any other nation if we wanted to through the cyber realm. But we have also more to lose than any other nation. We are more wired than any other nation. Uh, among the cyber attacks that I worry the most about is an attack on our financial institutions. Imagine if you could have a cyber attack that called into question whether people really had the savings they thought they had uh, and could wipe out uh, or make you prove somehow that you had the, uh, your whole life uh, uh, earnings and retirement uh, secure or not. Um, so what do you do to a North Korea that has little to lose? Well, one of the things that gets the North Koreans' attention is information. When the South Koreans want to respond to North Korean provocations, even when the North fires artillery and kills South Koreans, they often respond with information. Sometimes it's just blared through loudspeakers uh, that tells the North just how uh, terrible a ruler they have, uh, just how poorly they live, how much better off the rest of the world is, how they're starving their own people to feed a nuclear program they don't need is making them less secure. The North Koreans hate that because, of course, it threatens the regime. Um, that, I think, would have been a good response to the North Korean hack, uh, which would have been an information response of our own, uh, which could take a number of different forms. Um, and what about Russia? What well, would, yeah, yes, what would be you know, the, the, other, uh, the other point on Russia is when it became clear the Russians were meddling in our election, uh, Senator Feinstein and I urged the administration to act, to first make public attribution, uh, but then also to levy consequences on the Russians, economic consequences. Again, I don't think the right response to Russia would have been hacking 
Russian democratic institutions. <laughs> they have enough problems uh, of their own uh, to the degree they have been attacked and marginalized by the Russians' own government. But, uh, but levying economic sanctions is what gets the Russians' attention. Uh, because again, economic distress causing popular foment, uh, causing a threat to the regime is what gets Putin's attention. Uh, and uh, it's why, of course, the number one ask the Russians have is relief from the sanctions over Ukraine. Uh, so uh, Senator Feinstein and I, when it became apparent to us that the Russians were doing this and the evidence was, was very strong, uh, urged the administration to begin by attributing this to Russia, which at the time the administration was not willing to do. Why? Well, I, I think for a number of reasons. I think um, first they didn't want to be perceived as putting their hand on the scale. Uh, and tipping it, the election towards Hillary Clinton. So they were very careful to avoid any perception that they were trying themselves to interfere in the election. I think they also were concerned about uh, the Russians escalating. Um, my concern was more that if we didn't do anything, the Russians would perceive it as an open door. Uh, in my experience, the Russians, th there is a risk of uh, doing too much, but there's also a risk of doing too little. Uh, and in this case, I thought we were doing too little. Senator Feinstein and I ultimately took a rather extraordinary step, which was to issue our own statement of attribution, which we had to vet with the intelligence agencies because we were drawing on uh, intelligence that was being provided uh, to us. Uh, now, ultimately, the administration did make a public attribution, but it was a single written statement unaccompanied by an effort to impose sanctions on Russia and by not doing more, I think it, it telegraphed that this was not that big of a deal. Uh, and, and, I, and I think that had the administration, as, as I was urging at the time, begun discussions with Europe over a new round of sanctions, talk with the Europeans who themselves were enduring Russian interference, that would have telegraphed not only to the Russians how serious we take this, but to our own public how seriously we take it. Yeah. Next question. Thank you. Hi, Congressman, thanks for coming. Um, so my question is about, uh, you've mentioned before the uh, steep learning curve of the Intel Committee and sort of like uh, getting up to speed on all the necessary information. So if that's hard enough for a congressman to do over several years, um, when thinking about the President of the United States right now, um, what, uh, and um, where am I going with this? Well, what, <laughs> Uh, what do you make of the politicization of the intelligence community? And so having a president who's not only might not know what's going on uh, in these uh, briefings, but has openly um, dismissed uh, several uh, parts of the intelligence community and how that plays into your work um, in Congress. Well, I, you know, I think it's been uh, phenomenally destructive uh, to, to the presidency, uh, to his own chance of having a successful uh, presidency, uh, for him to impugn the credibility uh, of the intelligence agencies. And, you know, he's accused them of gross illegality. Uh, he's accused them of operating like Nazi Germany at times. Um, he has referred to them disparagingly as, are these the, you know, the people who brought us the intelligence on Iraq's WMD program? Uh, and of course, what that reinforces to the rest of the world is you can't trust American intelligence. Uh, now, the president just found out how destructive that is when he had to make the case that the Syrians were gassing their own people. Mm -hmm. uh, and what's more, that the Russians were lying about it. Because how did the president know this? He was relying on the work of the American intelligence agencies. Now, he didn't seek the cooperation of our allies. But if he had, you can imagine how that might go. Uh, if the president is saying, uh, you got to believe this, us, this is Assad, he's gassing his own people, uh, and some of our reluctant allies saying, are these the same agencies you were just saying were acting like Nazis and were, uh, you know, gave, gave us that great intelligence on Iraq's WMD program? Uh, so um, I think it's done a lot of damage. Uh, I think when he in an effort to further justify the unjustifiable tweets uh, about him being the victim of illegal surveillance, uh, brought the British into it uh, by suggesting, well, okay, maybe uh, the FBI wasn't involved or the CIA, but maybe it was the British who are acting on the president's request. 
You know, the British intel agencies are among our closest intel partners, our Five Eyes partners. Uh, you know, they had to go the extraordinary step of saying that the American president was speaking nonsense. Uh, that doesn't help the relationship. Uh, when in a public forum with Angela Merkel, our president quips, if, and that's probably the most polite word I can use for it, <laughs> Uh, that, hey, you and I have something in common. We've both been uh, surveilled by Obama. Mm -hmm. That is not funny uh, for the German chancellor. Mm -hmm. um, it's neither, uh, well, in any event, that doesn't help the relationship either. So all of this has been destructive. Uh, now, our agencies, I think, are extraordinarily professional and have a lot of very committed uh, public servants they're going to do their job no matter what the president says. Uh, they're going to get the best intelligence they have. They're going to provide it to the White House. They're going to have to hope the president respects it and will make use of it because they've not only risked their lives to get it, but risked the lives of others. But there's no question it makes it that much more difficult. If you're out in the field somewhere and you're trying to recruit someone uh, and they have to wonder whether they'd be risking their lives uh, to, to help provide information that a president of the United States is going to disregard, that's a problem. Um, and you know, one other observation I'll make, obviously the people that, that we recruit uh, have their own motivations, and sometimes it's financial, but sometimes it's ideological. And uh, to the degree that we, we undermine uh, what America stands for, we don't give people a reason to risk their lives for the country. You know, I, I was in Munich for a national security conference, if you'll let me digress for, for a second, uh, with John McCain, and uh, it's always a delight to travel with John McCain. I'm told if John McCain likes you, he insults you, um, so he must like me a lot. Because <laughs> um, he usually introduces me as Adam Schiff, he's a good guy for somebody who gets things right about 0% of the time. Um, but he introduces Lindsey Graham, who's his closest friend in the Senate, uh, by saying, this is Lindsey Graham, most people know Lindsey Graham, few people like him. Um, <laughs> so there may be some truth to, to what was told to me, but um, in any event, he, he has the most wonderful dinner guests when you travel with him, so he invited Bono and Bill Gates to dinner with us. And, uh, um, and I, I have a real grudge with Bono because no one person should have that much talent. Uh, because by definition that leaves so much less for the rest of us. Uh, and the guy is not only obviously this most phenomenal musician, but an incredible philanthropist, but the guy speaks like a poet. And I was very struck uh, by something he said. We, we kind of degenerated at that point in the evening to telling jokes. And he told a joke about Ireland and then he said, uh, but I have to say, you know, I'm very proud of being Irish. I'm very proud of Ireland. Uh, but Ireland, like most countries, is just a country. America is also an idea. Uh, and it really struck me when he said that, um, what has so concerned me about this presidency, and that is that it puts the idea of America at risk. Uh, because I think about those young people in Tahrir Square uh, who were so idealistic and before their revolution was hijacked by the Islamists, uh, many of those young uh, secular opponents uh, are in jail right now, and others are worried about going to jail, and some are under home arrest, and they probably wonder, is anyone standing up for me anymore? Uh, and, uh, and I think you know, that whole idea of what America stands for is at risk, uh, and, and it, it's why I, I got so much uh, heart out of seeing so many people take to the streets, uh, go to the airports during the days when the, the Muslim ban was in effect, but more generally take to the streets uh, to show that there are people who are standing up for those people in Tahrir Square who still want human rights to be on the agenda of the United States, uh, who are still in favor of democracy promotion, uh, not at the point of a gun, but at the, at the point of the battle of ideas. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. We'll have this as our last question to close out tonight. Hi, um, Isabel Deansteg. I'm a second year master in public policy student. Um, and my question is bringing us back to this conversation about how to um, communicate with the American people about foreign policy. And so you spoke about how the Democrats failed to do this well and failed to get people to internalize this Russian threat. And you spoke about advancing this argument that um, 
people have been manipulated, kind of wake up to the idea that you know, the Russians are trying to manipulate you. And though I think that's true, it strikes me that this is difficult because people don't want to think of themselves as subject and vulnerable to that kind of manipulation. So that's like the challenge. And then on the other hand, one tried and true way of talking about foreign policy is nationalism. And so my question is, do you feel that the Democrats are going to be pulled towards this kind of nationalist, like heightened rhetoric? And how do you avoid that? Um, how do you talk about these issues in your district? Kind of where is this going? Well, I think your point about manipulation is a very important one because um, people, are, I think, are only manipulated if they don't understand the, the context of the information they're being given. Um, and, and it's why I was making that point earlier about why I thought it was so important that, uh, that not only Democrats, but when the media was reporting this, they set out the context. Because once you know the context, you're no longer manipulated because you can decide it matters to you or you can decide it doesn't matter to you. But you have the information that you need. Uh, where I think we're, we're all at risk of manipulation is uh, when we're being in, given information and we don't know why, uh, we don't know from whence it's coming, uh, we don't know the, the provenance or the accuracy of it, that, that really does concern me. And, uh, and I think that problem is, is now very manifest and, and not just vis-a-vis -vis Russia, but there is now this proliferation of uh, of completely made up stuff uh, that is being peddled and by the time you figure out it's made up, it's already had its intended effect. Uh, combating that is phenomenally difficult. Um, with respect to the, the broader point though, that are we headed in the same direction that we see in, in Europe and other parts of the world uh, where these appeals to nativism uh, and sometimes xenophobia are gaining more and more traction? Uh, I, I do worry about this. Um, you know, I, I do think that we are seeing in the United States and around the world, and maybe as a product of globalization, forces that are being unearthed uh, that, uh, that we have to contend with. Uh, and we have to offer people solutions uh, that um, don't incline them to fall back on stereotypes or prejudices uh, or divide one group of people from another. Uh, and, and I think, you know, in terms of the political challenge this presents, uh, that uh, for my party, uh, I don't think that we um, ought to embark a str on a strategy of trying to win over 51% of the vote. Um, I think that may have been the strategy we had in this election. I think we need to figure out how do we appeal to people all over the country. Uh, and I think we have something to offer people all over the country, including in the deepest of the red states. Um, but we have to not just talk about what the message is to combat uh, either uh, you know, the other party or some of these other uh, more worrying forces that are out there, but what is the agenda that we have to offer? Um, it may be in certain parts of the country, the jobs that were there, those jobs aren't coming back but we have to be able to articulate what jobs we can bring, what we can offer, what reasons we do have uh, to give people why they can expect that their children's lives will be better, not worse, than their own lives. One of the very interesting, I thought, dividing lines in the election, when you look at the map of the red and the blue, um, you know, it looks so geographic and, uh, and that just different parts of the country view things differently. Within the red and blue, there were some very uh, significant common denominators, and one of them was in communities that were growing, people supported Hillary Clinton. In communities that were shrinking, whether they were in red or blue areas, uh, they went with Donald Trump. Uh, and in those communities that were shrinking, many of them were shrinking because there weren't jobs, there weren't opportunities, there wasn't hope for the future. Uh, and people in communities that were growing, people were moving there for the jobs, for the opportunity, in the hope of something better. Those communities that, that feel quite literally left behind, um, we need to have something to offer them. Uh, and more broadly, we need to have answers for how we address the economic dislocation that has come with globalism, that has unleashed a lot of these nativist forces. Uh, we, my party needs to do it if we want to win elections again. 
We as Americans need to do it if we want to combat these nativist forces uh, at home and if we want to combat these very divisive trends uh, all over the world. Congressman Schiff, thank you so much for your work. Thank you. We sure appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. I know when, uh, when President Putin ordered uh, uh, these incursions on our election that he didn't intend uh, to do us uh, a favor. Uh, but he also unwittingly uh, provided the force that has lifted Congressman Schiff to greater prominence in our politics. And in that sense, he unwittingly did the country a great favor. So we, we thank you so much for being here, and Steve, for your usual wonderful job of moderating, and for your great questions. Yeah. Good night. Thank you all so much.